In this lesson, we will do some practice problems. We will not study about any new statement. So if you see the lab manual, the first task is about survey for favorite beverages. Your program will ask the user to enter the favorite beverage of the first person and then for the second person and then so on until a value zero is entered by the user to end the survey. There are four beverages in the list, coffee, tea, coke and orange juice. The user will be entering one, two, three or four to select a specific beverage and will enter zero to end the process. When user will end the process, your program should display the result in the form of total number of people participated in the survey and the number of the votes against each beverage. So let's do that over here. Here I have printed the starting message of the program. You can see the output. It displays the list of the beverages and tells the user that he has to enter from 1 to 4 to select one of the beverage and 0 to exit the program. Firstly, you should understand that we have to use a while loop over here because we don't know how many persons will be participating in the survey. So maybe I can have an infinite while loop over here and then inside the while loop I will use a break statement to end the process. I'm taking the option from the user. Because we have to count total number of persons who have participated in the survey, so I should declare a count variable for example as p equal to 1. And then here I can use that p with the input message as well. Now I have to count the number of votes for each of the beverage, so I must have one count variable for each of those. C is for coffee, T is for tea, K is for coke and O is for orange. All are initialized to zero. Now I can apply the check on the option entered by the user. If it is one, I will increment the count variable of the coffee and so on for the other three values. I should also increase the person count. Moreover, if zero is entered by the user, I should use a break statement to end the process. Now outside the while loop, I can display the end results. Let's run the code. It's asking for the option of person 1. I'm entering 2 which is for T and then for the second person and now for the next persons. And now I will enter 0 to end the process. So you can see the result over here. 2 votes were for the coffee and 2 were for the tea and for the coke and orange juice it was 0. The total persons participated is displayed as 5 but it should have been 4 because the last one was not a person participated in the survey but that was to end the process. So let's see where we did the mistake. Here we are initializing the variable p to 1 and then over here inside the while loop we are incrementing the value of p. So I think the mistake is on line number 9. The persons before start of the while loop should be 0. I will increase the number of statics on the display as well. Then I will also add double tabs in the first three beverages because they have short name and the orange juice has the lengthy name. So on that I will keep it as single tab. So let's run the code again. I'm entering different options. Now this time the result display is better and the total number of persons participated is also correct. We should also add the possibility of invalid entry by the user. So instead of int, I can have a val over here. And then I can write a condition that if the type of the input number is not int, or it is not between 0 to 4,
then I can display an appropriate message. And I should use a continuous statement so that the rest of the loop body is not executed and the next iteration starts from line number 11. So let's run this. If I'm entering a wrong value, you can see because of that continuous statement, it is again asking for the option of the person 3. Now the next task is regarding an integer known as square free. An integer is a square free integer if it is not divisible by any perfect square, but of course other than 1. A perfect square is an integer whose square root is also an integer. For example, square root of 4 is 2, so 4 is a perfect square number. But the square root of 5 is not an integer, it is 2 point something, so 5 is not a perfect square. So 42 is a square free number because its factors or divisors are 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 21 and 42 and other than 1, all divisors are not perfect square which makes 42 a square free number. On the other hand, if you see this 45, it is not a square free number because it is divisible by 9 and 9 is a perfect square. So your program will ask the user to enter an integer and it will display if it is a square free or not. I have mentioned here that you have to create two functions for this program. One will be is perfect square. It will have one number as the input argument and it will return true if the number is perfect square and false otherwise. And then you have to create the second function which is is square free. Again this will have one input argument. You will find all its factors from 2 to the number and you will use the first function which is is perfect square to see if any of the roots is perfect square or not and will decide if the number is square free or not. So the main structure of the program is given over here. You have to complete the logic of the two functions. I will do this task without creating the user to find functions and I will do all calculations in the main program. So here I am taking a number from the user. I have to check all factors from 2 to the number, so I will set the loop variable value from 2 to the enter number. Then inside the for loop, I will first check if the loop variable i is factor of the enter number or not and if it is a factor, then I have to check if it is a perfect square or not. To check if a number is a perfect square or not, the condition is that the square root of that number is an integer. So I can take the square root of that number which is i over here. If the value of variable i is 4, the square root of 4 is 2, but still the data type of a will be floating data type. So I cannot apply a check on the data type of variable a to decide if the square root of i is integer or not. What I can do is, I can convert the value of a into integer and I can compare that converted value with the variable a. So in case of 4, the square root of 4 is 2.0. When converted to integer, that will be 2 and a equal equal to integer of a will return true. But it will not return true in case of for example 5 or any other number whose square root is not an integer. So if that is the case, the number is not square free. So I can change the check variable equal to false. And then outside the loop, I can apply a condition on the check variable. If that is true, the number is square free. And if it is false, the number is not a square free. Let's enter 42 and it is a square free number. Let's enter 45 and it is not a square free number. So we have completed the task but if you recall from the last lesson that we have some useful loop control statements. So to make this program efficient, I should use the break statement. I can remove this check variable and if on any iteration a perfect square is found, we can declare over there that a number is not a square free number.
and then we can use a break statement to end the for loop and outside the for loop we can have an else block which is executed only when the break statement is not executed inside the for loop which means there was no perfect square and we can declare that the number is a square free number. Let's check this one more time. Now let's move to the next task. Over here we have to take a number from the user and we have to display if the number is palindrome or not. A number is a palindrome if we write that in the reverse order and that reversed number is same as the original number. For example, this 1331 is a number and if I reverse this number, it will again be 1331. So it is a palindrome number. On the other hand, this number 1330 is not a palindrome number because if I will write it in the reverse order, it will be 0331 which is different from 1330. So let's do this over here. What can be the logic for this program? The major logic of this program is to create a reverse number of the original number. If we are able to do that, the rest is just the comparison. If the reverse number is same as of the original number or not. So the key logic is to generate the reverse of any number. Many times it is better to start the logic development by considering some example rather than the general case. So over here instead of taking a number from the user, let's consider some number. And our main task is to generate a reverse of this number. Which will be this number. The process will be separating the unit digit from the number and then getting the remaining number. So I can use the modulus or the remainder dvn by 10 to get the unit digit and I can use the floor dvn by 10 to get the remaining part of the number. Let's first print the two values. And you can see the variable a has a unit digit 2 and the variable b has a remaining part which is 4568. Now we have to separate the unit digit of the remaining part as well and we will keep on doing this until all digits are separated and then will be the process of getting all those numbers in reverse order. So if you see this example on the lab manual, if the variable x is 5429, then by using the remainder dvn we will get 9 and by using the floor dvn we will get 542. Then we need to do the same thing on the 542 and the remainder dvn will give the 2 and the floor dvn will give 54. We need to do this again and the remainder dvn will give 4 and the floor dvn will give 5. We will do this one more time on 5, the remainder dvn will give the 5 and floor dvn will give 0. And basically this getting a zero is an indication to stop this process because we don't know how many are the digits in the number and depending on that we have to repeat this process. And therefore we will do this using a while loop. Instead of b equal to x floored vn by 10, I should use x equal to x floored vn by 10. So that x gets the value of the remaining number and if I repeat these two statements, I will get next unit digit and the next remaining number. Let's have a detailed print statement. And now I can make these three statements as the block of the while loop and the condition will be that x is not equal to 0. So until the x is not 0, this process will continue. And you can see in each iteration of the while loop, a unit digit is separated and we are getting the remaining digit. So we are able to separate all unit digits one by one in each iteration of the while loop. Now the next task is to generate the reverse number from those separate numbers. If you see that on this last column where we have to generate the reverse number, the first digit separated was 9. So at that stage the reverse number is 9. The second separated digit was 2. So the reverse number will become from 9 to 92. And for the next separated digit which is 4, that 92 should become 924 and so on for the last step and we will get the reverse number. So what can be the formula of this reverse calculation? See carefully and it's not difficult. If I have 9 and 2, how can I get 92? Or if I have 92 and 4, how I can get 924? So it's very simple that you will multiply the value of reverse with 10 and you will add the separated unit digit. And before the start of this process, the reverse value should be 0. 
So in first step 0 times 10 will be 0 plus 9 will be 9. In second step 9 times 10 will be 90 plus 2 will be 92. In third step 92 times 10 will be 920 plus 4 will be 924 and so on. So let's do that over here. I will declare a variable reverse equal to 0 before the while loop and then inside the while loop I will update the value of the reverse variable as reverse equal to previous value of reverse times 10 plus a which is the separated unit digit. Now let's print the value of the reverse as well. And if we run the code you can see how the reverse is updated in each iteration of the while loop. And finally we are able to get the reverse value of the number x. So the next calculation is very simple. I will simply check if the value x and the reverse are equal or not. But wait a minute and see carefully that what is inside this variable x on line number 8. Variable x was having some value on line number 1 but inside the while loop that x was being updated in each iteration and you can see the condition of the while loop is that x is not equal to 0 so it obviously means that outside the while loop the value of x will be 0. So we don't have the original value of the x. And the solution is very simple. We can have one copy of the variable x before we use that in the while loop. For example y equal to x. The value of y is not updated at all. So outside the while loop the value of y is the original value of variable x. So here I can compare the value of y with the reverse value and I can print the message accordingly. Now instead of a specific value of variable x, I can take that value from the user and that will complete this task. Let's test it for different values. And the results are correct. Let's try some bigger value. It is a palindrome number and displayed correctly. Now the next task was to generate all palindrome numbers from 1 to 10,000. Now here I will not take the value from the user and all I need is to generate numbers from 1 to 10,000 and apply this logic on each of those. So I can make it as a block of the for loop. I will use the loop variable as x because the whole logic is already written on the variable x and I will set the values from 1 to 10,000. We don't need to display if it is a palindrome or not. We just need to display the number if it is a palindrome. Let's run this code. And these are all palindrome numbers till 10,000. You should do the remaining task of the lab manual as well. And now let's discuss the review question. The review question is about the approximate value of pi. The value of pi can be approximated by the following infinite series. So you have to calculate this value using this series. You can divide this series into two parts. The first is the value 3 and next is this series. Now how can we generate this series? See carefully the terms of this series. On numerator we have the fixed value 4. So that's not a big issue. But on the denominator we have different values. If you see the first value of the denominator it is 2 and in the next term it is 4 then 6 and then 8 and then so on. So you can generate these numbers using the range function by setting the step variable equal to 2. Now consider one term, the first value is 2 over here which will be the loop variable and the other two values are simply 2 plus 1 and 2 plus 2. So if the loop variable is i, it is i times i plus 1 times i plus 2 and so on for the second term, the loop variable i will be 4 and the denominator is i times i plus 1 times i plus 2. So that's how the denominator will have the updated value in each iteration. But one very tricky part over here is that one term is being added into the series and the next term is being subtracted from the series. So it is not simple summation of the series. You have to generate the terms of the series and they will get added and subtracted one by one. So your program should display 20 approximations of the value of the pi. The first approximation will consider only the first term which is 3. The second approximation will consider the first two terms. The third approximation will consider the first three terms and so on until the 20th approximation will consider first 20 terms. That's all from this lesson. Thanks for watching.